My name is Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, Senior Pastor for the Fort Lauderdale Seventh-day Adventist Church. On behalf of the Board of Elders, it is my happy pleasure and privilege to welcome you to our telecast today. Just before my sermon today, let us lift our hearts to God in prayerful meditation. O oh, divine, majestic, loving Heavenly Father, we pause to thank you for this brand new year. We thank you for this brand new day. We pray your blessing upon every single person under the sound of my voice, because I ask it in Jesus' name. Before our sermon today, we will have the scripture meditation and then infinite praise. Hello and happy Sabbath. My name is Kevin Pierre. I'm here to read Isaiah 43, verse 16 through 19. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Remember, ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you all. Happy Sabbath and have a great day. Thank you.
Today, I would like to begin a sermon series from the book of Isaiah. My text is taken from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, ye shall not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and the rivers in the desert. I don't know about you, but I just like the translation from the Message Bible of the same passage, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert, be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I am making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. God says, I'm about to do a new thing. Yes, speaking about new things, Oprah Winfrey says, cheers to a new year and another chance to get it right. Vern McLean says, what the new year brings to you will depend a great deal on what you bring to the new year. Joel Osteen says, let go of yesterday. Let today be a brand new beginning and be the best that you can and you'll get to where God wants you to be. Melody Beatty says, the new year stands before us like a chapter in a book waiting to be written. Alex Morris says, new year, a new chapter, a new verse, or just the same old story. Ultimately, we write it. The choice is ours. Kate Summer says, a brand new year could be considered the seed and your goals could be the buds. But taking action and achieving your dreams, well, that is the flower. May the new year be your seed and may you have lots of flowers to inspire you. Hilary Di Piano says, we all get the exact same 365 days. The only difference is what we do with them. Speaking of a new year, at the beginning of a new year, one friend complains to another, all my husband and I do is fight. I've been so upset. Imagine I've lost 20 pounds. If it's that bad, why don't you just leave him, asks the other friend. I'd like to lose another 15 pounds first before I leave. Yes, my friend, a new year offers a fresh start, a new beginning. It is often a time for reflection on the past and a look into the future, hoping for a better year ahead. Yes, it is imperative that we begin this new year with Almighty God. God is the author of new beginnings, so we should begin every single day with God. And so I've stopped by to tell you of the awesome promise God has tweeted through the prophet Isaiah. Yes, I hear God still saying, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I say, praise the Lord. In other words, God is saying, don't worry about the bad things. Don't focus on the negative things of last year. Why? Well, I'm happy that you asked. Because God is the author of new beginnings. And I've come by to tell you that he can make a way out of no way. Just like how he created the world, ex nihilio, which is a Latin phrase which literally means out of nothing. That is how powerful my God is. It is often used by Christians to describe the biblical view of creation. I'm talking about the word ex nihilio. However, before we unpack 
Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 through 19, our key text for today. Let me tell you something about the context. Isaiah lived in a troubled world for both Judah and Israel. It was an era of crisis. Yes, the people of God had fallen deeply into sin. Uh, the Bible tells us under Uzziah in Judah and Jeroboam the second in Israel, both nations had grown strong and prosperous, but material prosperity brought spiritual decline. Yes, the people forsook Almighty God and His ways of righteousness. Social and moral conditions were much the same in both nations. Everywhere there was a miscarriage of justice, for magistrates judge for reward, and rulers were primarily interested in pleasure and personal gain. Yes, my friend, greed and vice were the order of the day. As the rich became richer, the poor became poorer, or many sank into the depths of poverty and were reduced to the status of being slaves. Yes, many of the people forsook of the worship of Jehovah and followed the heathen gods. Yes, my friend, others clung to the outward forms of religion, but knew nothing of its meaning and power. And so Isaiah warned of the people that God would withdraw himself from a people, though they professed to pursue righteousness, followed the ways of evil. Uh, the nation was warned of the fact that the continuance in the way of evil would result in speedy destruction. God would employ the Assyrians as his tool to execute justice upon a nation of hypocrites. Isaiah set forth the fact that the entire world was ruled by one God. A God who required righteousness, not only of the Hebrew people, but of all of the nations of the earth. And who would judge all people who persisted in their evil ways. So when we come to Isaiah chapter 43, some of the people have been taken to exile in Babylon, while others remain in the land. But both groups suffered under the hands of their captors. Yes, Kelly Plunkett Bruton says, physically, economically, culturally, and religiously, the people felt the might of Babylon, which was a superpower at that particular time. And it seems that one of the tasks of the prophet uh, was to rebel uh, the people's understanding of themselves as God's own people and to reassure them that God was fully capable of taking on the Babylonian superpower in order to save them. Yes, when we come to Isaiah chapter 43 verses 16 and 17, uh, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters, which, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Yes, in other words, the God addressing the people in the verses that I just read is none other than the God who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out the chariot and horse. They are extinguished and quenched according to verse 17. Yes, Kelly Plunkett Brudens argues that the image is stirring and visual and highlights the power of God over both the forces of nature and military might. A power to which the Exodus, the foundational story of the people of Israel, verify. Yes, the similarities between Isaiah chapter 43 verses 16 through 17 and the description of the miraculous rescue of the people at the sea in Exodus 14 and 15 strongly suggests that the prophet is invoking their cultural memory of the dramatic story of the redemption of God's people 
from the might of the Babylonians in Egypt. Yes, my friends, let's take a tour down memory lane. Uh, to Exodus chapter 14, we find the Israelites in an impossible situation. They fell trapped with the Red Sea ahead of them and their oppressors closing in from behind. They had forgotten it was God in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night who had led them to the very place that they were in at that particular time. And so as we begin this new year, I've come by to remind you of what my favorite author says. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us. We have many duties to perform because we have been made the depositories of sacred truth to be given to the world in all its beauty and glory. We are debtors to God to use every advantage he has entrusted to us to beautify the truth by holiness of character and to send the message of warning and of comfort, of hope and love to those who are in darkness of error and sin. Yes, other people had forgotten that it was God that led them to the Red Sea. Watch this. Pharaoh collected his um, forces, 600 chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt. Can you imagine that? All the chariots of Egypt, horsemen, captains, and foot soldiers, the king himself attended by the great men of his realm, headed the attacking army to secure the favor of the gods, and thus ensure the success of their undertakings. Uh, the priests also accompanied them. Uh, the king was determined to intimidate the Israelites by a grand display of power. The Egyptians feared that their forced submission to the God of Israel would subject them to laughter and derision uh, by other nations. But if they should now go forth with a great show of power and bring back the fugitives, I'm talking about the Israelites, uh, they would redeem their glory. Suddenly, uh, they saw in the distance the flashing armor as the force drew nearer. The army of Egypt was seen in full pursuit. Terror filled the hearts of Israel. Because there were no graves in Egypt, Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? And so when we come to Exodus chapter 14, uh, verses 11 through 12, it says, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us uh, to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Yes, Moses uh, was greatly troubled uh, that his people uh, should manifest so little faith in Almighty God. Notwithstanding that they have repeatedly witnessed uh, the manifestation of his power in their behalf. How could they charge upon him the dangerous and difficulties of their situation when he had followed the express command of God? True, uh, there was no possibility of deliverance unless God himself uh, should interpose for their release. But having been brought into this position of obedience to the divine direction, Moses felt no fear of the consequence his calm and assuring reply to the people was Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For uh, the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. For Moses was under tremendous pressure at that particular time. And so when he asked the people of Israel to wait on the Lord, 
uh, lacking discipline and self-control, they became completely unreasonable. Watch this. They expected speedily uh, to fall into the hands of their oppressors. And their wailings and lamentations were loud and deep. The wonderful pillar of cloud uh, that had been followed as the signal of God to go forward. But now they question among themselves if it might not uh, foreshadow some great calamity for had it not led them on the wrong side of the mountain into an impassable way. Yes, thus uh, the angel of God appeared to their deluded minds as the harbinger of disaster. But now as the Egyptians host approached them, expecting uh, to make them an easy prey, the cloudy column rose majestically into the heavens, passed over the Israelites and descended uh, between them. And the armies of Egypt, a wall of darkness interposed between the pursued and their pursuers. The Egyptians could no longer discern the camp of the Hebrews and were forced to halt. But as the darkness of night deepened, the wall of cloud became a great light to the Hebrews, flooding the entire encampment with the radiance of day. Then hope returned to the hearts of Israel, and Moses lifted up his voice unto the Lord. And I say, Hallelujah. And so when you come to Exodus chapter 14 and verse 15 through 16, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Yes, as Moses stretched out his rod, the waters parted and Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground while the waters stood like a wall upon each side. The light from God's pillar of fire shone upon the foam-capped billows and lighted the road that was cut like a mighty furrow through the waters of the sea and was lost in the obscurity of the farther shore. Yes, Exodus chapter 14 verse 23 says, The Egyptians pursued and went in after them uh, to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire, of the cloud and trouble the host of the Egyptians, the Bible says. Uh, the mysterious cloud changed to a pillar of fire before their astonished eyes. Can you imagine that? The thunders pealed and the lightning flashed. The Egyptians were seized with confusion and dismay amid the wrath of the elements in which they were heard the voice of an angry God. They endeavored to retrace their steps and flee uh, to the shore they had quitted. Uh, but Moses stretched out his rod and the, and the piled up waters hissing, roaring, and eager for their prey, rushed together and swallowed the Egyptian army in their black depths. As morning broke, it revealed to the multitudes of Israel that God destroyed their enemies. From the most terrible peril, one night had brought complete deliverance. And so as we move back to our text, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, Remember ye not of the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I say, praise the Lord. It is interesting that the prophet Isaiah, having gone uh, to so much effort to invoke the past, continues in verse 18 
with the injunction, do not remember the former things of old. In other words, the command is surprising and serves as an effective rhetorical device to get the people's attention. Yes, for the prophet is not content uh, to have the people uh, wax nostalgic about the good old days. It is not on the past that the prophet wants the people to concentrate. And so even as we come to this new year, I don't want you thinking about last year. I want you to focus on God. I want you to focus on Jesus. I want, to fo want you to focus on all of the good things God has in store for you. And so the prophet aims uh, to create an imaginative space in the minds of the people so that their conception of the past can transform their understanding of the present and thus the future. And that is why the prophet was saying, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In a seemingly hopeless situation, the prophet calls on the people not to lose heart, but to look with anticipation for the signs of God's approaching redemption for the new thing that is coming. I'm talking about the new thing that is just around the corner. Behold, I will do a new thing. Staying stuck in the past can keep us from the new thing God wants to do. If Israel stayed stuck in the discouragement and the seduction of Babylon, they would never look for the new thing of release from exile. And so we can make an idol out of the new. We can be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Likewise, we can also work against the new thing God wants to do. Verse 19 says, Shall ye not know it? God asks the same question today. Will you stay in step with my spirit? When he leads into something new, shall ye not know it? That is what the Bible is saying. And so my friend, God says, I will even make a road in the wilderness. Uh, between uh, the captivity in Babylon and the return of Israel lay hundreds of miles of wilderness. God's people uh, didn't need to be afraid because God would make a road in the wilderness. I'm talking about making a highway. I'm talking about making an I-95 or an Interstate 75 in the wilderness. And even protect his people from the wild animals. Because the beast of the field will honor me, the Lord says. Often when God makes a promise, we worry about the details of the obstacles for the fulfillment of the promise. But God replies, don't worry. Don't worry about anything because everything is going to be all right. And so I will even make a road in the wilderness. And so he's saying, I have the resources and plans you don't even know about in this new year. Leave your problems to me. The new thing is described in non-specific language that seems to refer to the past even as it points to the future. For example, water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert in verses 19 and 20 suggest a link between uh, the Exodus journey and the return of Judah's exile from Babylon. The animals mentioned in verse 20 underscore the desolation of the land through which the people will travel on their way home and serve to remind the people of their ancestors' journey out of Egypt into the wilderness. And so even the animals that live in the wild places are amazed at the marvelous deeds of this God who gives water in the wilderness. A journey through the wilderness will be hard. But the grace and power of God that prevail in the past will be available in the future. The past is even now repeating itself. Do you not perceive it? The prophet says. And so my friends, I've come by to tell you, do not remember. Because God says, I will do a new thing. At the beginning of this new year, I invite you to follow God's leading. Go forward in faith and confidence in Almighty God. And so as I bring the message to a close, some time ago, I read an article about the Biosphere 2 that was written by Anna Pompant. 
In short, the Biosphere 2 is a miniature version of our planet Earth, now owned by the University of Arizona, constructed by scientists uh, to study how the planet's uh, living systems actually work. Learnings uh, from this tiny planet enabled scientists to innovate and come up with new ideas related to the growth of plants. A major discovery from it was something they had never expected. Uh, the most interesting thing uh, they learned from it was the importance of wind in a plant's life. Who would have thought wind plays a critical role? Yes, in the biosphere too, they had trees growing faster than they would grow in the wild. Also, they found that these trees wouldn't completely mature before they could. Uh, they used to collapse. Uh, later, it was found that this was caused by a lack of wind in the biosphere. Turns out wind plays a major role in a tree's life. The presence of wind makes a tree stronger. It is thus able to mature and not fall on the ground uh, due to its own weight. When plants and trees uh, grow in the wild, the wind constantly keeps them moving. This causes a stress in the wooden load-bearing structure of the tree. So to compensate, the tree manages uh, to grow something called reaction wood or stress wood. Now watch this. This stress wood usually has a different structure and is able to position the tree where it get uh, the best light or optimum resources. Reason why trees can contort uh, toward best light and still survive loads even in awkward shapes. Uh, the tree uh, can grow in a more solid manner thanks to the reaction wood. If there is no wind, like in the biosphere too, the trees end up being much weaker and aren't able to survive for very long. Remember, stress is what makes a tree strong enough to sustain wear and tear that it would face later in life. What is the takeaway? The wind in our lives will make us develop stress wood that will enable us to reach the light or water more effectively. And so I've come by to tell you that Jesus is the light of the world and the water of life. Those who seek him are promised to find him. The wind helps us to seek Jesus. And so in this new year, I want you to be thankful for the wind. Because even when you fall down, you can get up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if there is no wind, the trees will break apart. The wind, the wind represents the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, we will fall apart. Perhaps this is the reason why we are falling apart as a world. And so we need the wind to make us strong. And so as you face stressful situations, I've come by to tell you this new year, you need to hold on like never before. And so I've come by to tell you that God has designed trees uh, to endure the wind. In fact, when the wind is blowing, the roots of the trees grow down deeper. And so my friends, I've come by to tell you that when people criticize you, it will make you stronger in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you face stressful situations this new year, hold on, don't throw in the towel. Continue to praise the Lord. Continue to worship the Lord Jesus, even if you have to do it online, even if you have to do it in the privacy of your home because I've come by to tell you there is power in the name of Jesus. Stand still. Trust in God because it will make you stronger as you grow in grace every single day.